Hey, we're Steven and Lauren. We're from Florida, and we spent the first three months of this year traveling across Australia. Apparently that's a strange thing to do, because while we were there, we constantly got asked, so are you here on a work visa, or exchange students, or part of a research project or something? And the truth is, no. We were just on a three month vacation. Now, if this sounds like total financial irresponsibility to you, hear us out, because by the end of our 15,000 kilometer driving tour to every state in Australia, plus a few bonus days in Hawaii, we actually came home $26,267 richer than the day we started. In this video, we're gonna reveal all the numbers, our different streams of income and investments, and exactly how much money they made, plus a cost breakdown of the entire trip, and all the hacks we used to make it cheap, from how we got a free rental car for three months, to how we got plane tickets for less than half their normal price, and a bunch more. By the way, anytime you hear a dollar amount in this video, it's already been converted into US dollars, unless we specifically mention otherwise. The first step to turning any long vacation into a financial success is just to find ways to spend less money while you're out there having fun. So let's walk through each of our spending categories and talk about how we cut tens of thousands of dollars out of our budget without really sacrificing anything. The first thing I wanna talk about is cars. Obviously we couldn't drive to Australia, but we did a whole lot of driving in Australia. This was a road trip at its core, and because of that, ground transportation was a pretty important expense to keep under control. When we first arrived, we grabbed a rental car on Turo for about $58 a day, knowing this wouldn't be a very cost-effective option for the entire trip. I mean, at that rate, it would cost over $5,000 for the whole three months. I tried explaining our situation to the guy whose car we rented, and he made us a pretty generous bulk pricing offer of three months for $2,000, plus maintenance costs, if we did the transaction offline and avoided the Turo fees. That's a massive discount for just having a conversation with somebody. But we still didn't really wanna blow two grand on a rental, so with that backup plan in our pocket, we decided to try something else. We sifted through cheap used cars for sale on Facebook Marketplace, and we turned up a 2002 Toyota Corolla Ascent wagon with only 87,000 miles on it for $3,300. We snapped it up immediately and ditched the rental idea. Starting in Sydney, we drove that car all the way across the continent to Perth and back again, totaling almost 10,000 miles. After paying for the car itself, an oil change, new spark plugs, taxes, registration, and basic liability insurance, our total cost of ownership was negative $63. We actually sold the car for more than we paid and made a profit. By the way, that car purchase and sale were the only two transactions we had to use physical cash for on this trip. Everything else went on credit cards, which made currency conversion much easier. But for the car, we had to deal with cash. And rather than converting currency at the airport or a bank, which are total ripoffs by the way, we figured out a couple methods to exchange money without fees and wrote a blog post about all of them, which is linked in the video description. So our car literally cost us nothing but we did still end up spending a total of $2,030 in ground transportation costs. Most of that was just gas. Our car got something like 30 miles per gallon, and average gas prices tended to hover around $1.80 Australian per liter, which is around $4.50 American per gallon. We were able to use receipts from grocery stores like Woolies and Kohl's to save a few cents per liter at some service stations too. The next biggest expense in this category was a $355 speeding ticket. Australian police are really strict about this stuff. We were warned about that ahead of time by plenty of locals and road signs, and I can honestly say I made every effort to obey the law, but unfortunately, Australian traffic cops are just as predatory as American ones. They caught me going 79 kilometers per hour just a few meters before the 80 kilometer per hour speed limit sign I was accelerating into. Very uncool in my opinion. Anyway, other expenses in this category included little things like parking meters, a self-serve car wash, and a couple of Uber rides in Hawaii on our way back home. Now, you might be thinking, cool that you drove around in a free car, but how'd you get there in the first place? An average one-way ticket from Florida to Australia generally falls in the $1,000 to $2,000 range. Since we needed two tickets there and two tickets back, we might have expected to pay $4,000 to $8,000 total. Fortunately, average ticket prices are meaningless when you're not on any set schedule. Since we were taking completely spontaneous vacation with no regard for employers or obligations, which by the way, we'll talk about a little more at the end of the video, we could just book the absolute cheapest flights available, regardless of dates. And that dropped the price a lot. 
I also came up with a hack to find cheap airline tickets on long routes. First, browse your options using Google Flights and take note of the most common connection points. From Florida to Australia, the most common stop on the cheapest route to Sydney seemed to be Hawaii. Once you've figured out that common connection point, try splitting your flight into two legs, one from your starting point to your connection and the other from that connecting city to your destination. Searching for each leg of your route separately often reveals options that give you a cheaper fare in total. If you're not in a hurry, you can deliberately spend some time at the connection point too. We were able to spend five nights in Hawaii on this trip to Australia, including two different Hawaiian islands, while only spending a grand total of $3,000 on all airfare. When using this hack though, it's extra important to pack light, because if you have any check bag fees, they're gonna apply separately on each leg of the trip. We did our trip with one check bag, and if we really tried, we certainly could have gotten away with carry-ons only. Aside from flights, the other costs in this category included round-trip ferries from Perth to Rottnest Island, home of some rare marsupials called quokkas, and from mainland Australia to Tasmania, which wound up being our favorite Australian state after visiting them all. Combined, all these flights and ferries totaled $3,773. Our biggest cost of all on this trip was lodging. On this 88-night journey, we stayed a whopping 75 nights in hotels, which are the most expensive accommodations possible. If you're trying to travel cheaply, this is the one part of our trip you might not want to copy. You'd be much better off signing a multi-month lease on an apartment somewhere, which is actually what we did for our honeymoon back in 2015, and it was way cheaper. Or you could just take a camper van adventure, which has been our default method of cheap travel more recently. With that said, we did hotels this time, and there are a few tricks you can use to reduce the cost of hotels a little bit if you decide to go that route too. First of all, if you're ever planning to be in one place for a while, make sure you negotiate an extended stay discount. We spent the first two weeks of this trip at a single hotel in Sydney, and they gave us a daily rate about 15% cheaper than if we'd only stayed a night or two. If we were willing to stay a month, it would have been a discount of about 35% instead. Also, when you're on the move for so long, you're obviously gonna have to wash your clothes sometimes, which means laundromats. But if you can time a hotel room that has in-unit laundry with your laundry day, it might save you a few bucks. And more importantly than that, a room with a full kitchen can save you big money on dining out. Whenever we could get these types of amenities without paying extra, we always chose them. Of our 75 nights in hotels, we actually only paid money for 65 of them. One easy trick we used was to earn free loyalty nights by booking our paid stays through Hotels.com, which has the best hotels rewards program by a long shot. With that said, they just announced a big change coming to their rewards program later in 2023, so that advice might not always be true. We also got to cash in on some old IHG rewards points we had sitting around from a previous credit card bonus offer. We could have gotten a lot more hotel nights this way if we'd really planned it out ahead of time, and if you're curious about that, you can always find our top recommended rewards cards on the recommendations page of our blog. Oh, and this one isn't exactly a hack, but I should also mention that hotels are just a bit cheaper in Australia than we're used to in the US. Of the ones we actually paid full price for, our average hotel cost was around $110 per night, including taxes, fees, and parking. And we actually got to stay in some really nice places with ocean views for that price sometimes. Apart from hotels, we stayed with personal friends in both Australia and Hawaii for eight free nights, and we also camped in a tent for two more cheap ones. The remaining three nights of the 88 were spent miserably in airplane seats. After combining all these things together, our total lodging cost was $7,459, which is actually under $85 per night across the whole trip. That's not exactly cheap, but it's also not ridiculous considering that we were in nice private hotel rooms for almost the entire time. Okay, next up is my favorite category, food. The best way to save money on food is to cook it yourself, which isn't always easy when traveling. We had pretty good luck finding hotels with kitchens, but they weren't always cost effective, so we came up with a few alternatives. In Australia, free public barbecue grills are common in parks and outdoor spaces, which let us cook without a proper kitchen, often with a nice view or some company from a kangaroo or water dragon. We also made sure to stock up on microwavable meals, since microwaves were in almost every hotel. And if that failed us, we always had the three most important ingredients in the car, P, B, and J. On day one of our trip, we bought basic cooking supplies like oil, seasonings, condiments, and non-perishables to keep handy at all times. But we had to go shopping for fresh, frozen, and refrigerated foods every time we traveled a long distance, which honestly was pretty frequently since we were covering so much ground. In the US, our biggest grocery shopping advice is to avoid grocery stores. Superstores like Walmart and Target have dramatically cheaper food, along with wholesale clubs like Costco and Sam's. But in Australia, there aren't as many alternatives to traditional grocery stores, so food costs are noticeably higher. 
All they probably had the best prices overall, but they're not as easy to find since they're mostly concentrated in larger towns. The total cost of all of our groceries on this trip was $1,254. Now, I know what you're thinking. When you're on vacation, you probably don't want to cook every single meal you eat. Neither did we. We ate out a lot, but we had a few tricks up our sleeve to save money there too. First of all, we found some Australian chains that we like and quickly became repeat customers, which made it worthwhile to sign up for a few restaurant loyalty programs. We actually ran into a little trouble with this at first because our Android phones were stuck in the American Google Play Store, preventing us from downloading Australian apps. But I eventually figured out a fix for that problem, which I wrote a post about on our blog and linked in the video description. This allowed us to score a ton of free food over the course of three months. We also learned that finding menu hacks is just as easy in Australia as it is in the US. For example, at Hungry Jack's, which is just the Australian Burger King, you can get a Rebel Whopper for 44% less money than the menu price by ordering every single ingredient a la carte. Just don't ask us how we figure this stuff out. Oh, and this may sound weird, but free water isn't as easy to come by in Australia. It's pretty standard for restaurants to try and sell you bottled water, and some don't even let you order tap water at all. So to solve this problem, we collected every free water bottle given to us by hotels in the backseat of our car, and then we just refilled them every night. So we always had a supply on hand. This was also really comforting when we were traveling in the outback far from civilization. Altogether, we dined out quite a bit and spent $1,974 at restaurants in these three months. As for entertainment, the amount we spent was pretty small on this vacation, just like most of our other trips, because there's just so much amazing stuff to do that costs almost nothing. Our go-to entertainment hack is just to find fun in nature. Anything labeled as a national park is usually pretty cool and either cheap or free to visit. Oh, and in Australia, basically every single beach is breathtaking. In the big cities like Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, and Brisbane, we found a ton of free museums and art galleries to explore, and public events happening all the time. We did fork over a couple hundred bucks to see one of our favorite bands, Pavement, play at the Perth Concert Hall though. We also had some long drives on this trip, and when it came to passing time on the road, our cheap car had no aux or Bluetooth inputs, but weirdly, that turned out to be a huge win. Out of desperation, we flipped on the radio and discovered a nationwide ad-free radio station called Triple J, which introduced us to a ton of awesome music that we'd never heard before. Outside of just entertainment, some other expenses of this trip included visa applications, an unlimited international cell phone plan for me, which I shared with Lauren via my phone's mobile hotspot feature, plenty of sunscreen, a bit of makeup, some clothes, and gifts for other people. Altogether, entertainment and all that other stuff totaled to just $1,165, our smallest spending category. Another cost you might be worried about on a trip as long as this one is health insurance. But we read the terms of our high deductible ACA plan in the US, and it actually covers emergencies when traveling internationally, as long as the trip doesn't exceed 90 days. So lucky for us, we didn't have to buy anything extra. Here's what all the expenses of our three-month adventure for two look like together. This was our absolute most expensive trip to date, clocking it at $100 per day per person. That's nearly three times more expensive than our typical van life road trip, which can be done for as little as $36 per day per person. The reason for that is pretty obvious from the chart, flights and hotels, which we don't have to pay for at all when we go on a camper van trip in North America. That's the way to really save money on travel. But let's put this into broader perspective. According to tripnumbers.com, a one-week vacation to Australia costs the average American couple $376 per day per person, or $223 if they're budget travelers, based on data pulled in April 2023. So although we spent a truckload of money by our own standards, apparently we spent 73% less than what's considered normal. I guess all those travel hacks really add up. Now, keeping our expenses under control was only part of this trip's financial feat. Remember, we came home with more money than when we started which means we were actually making money faster than we were spending it while on vacation. Here's the math. We spent a little under $18,000 on our trip. On top of that, we still had bills to pay back home, which totaled around $3,000 for a grand total of $21,000 in expenses. The fact that we came home with a net worth $26,000 higher than when we started implies that we brought in close to $47,000 while we were traveling for three months through a combination of freelance income and investment gains. So let's go through each one of those. First up, freelance income. I quit my full-time job recording physics tutoring videos about three years ago at age 29, when we figured out that we'd saved nearly enough money to retire for the rest of our lives. But rather than severing that income stream completely and leaving my employer without a replacement, 
I negotiated a part-time freelance agreement that can be fulfilled mostly remotely, which I've maintained to this day. And because I only do the absolute most critical parts of my old job, the hourly rate is pretty attractive. I quit my full-time job as a web marketer at age 29 too. I don't have any business connection to my old employer, but I do have a social media marketing client which lets me bring in a small stream of easy money every month, wherever I am. And since high school, we've both done professional photography as a side hustle. We mostly just shoot photos for fun when traveling, but we did book one paid gig in Hawaii during this trip. Last and definitely least, Trip of a Lifestyle brought in a very small amount of income for us as well. The grand total of all this side hustle money was around $19,000 during our three months in Australia, with workload small enough that it still completely felt like a vacation. The funniest thing about this trip is that we actually made more money by doing nothing than by working while we were gone. The biggest part of our early retirement strategy is passive investing. A huge portion of our portfolio is in stock market index funds, which swing wildly in value, but as a general rule, they appreciate strongly over the long periods of time while consistently paying dividends along the way, which they did while we were gone. We also own bonds and keep a bit of cash in a high yield savings account. These things pay us interest on a regular basis. None of these investments require maintenance of any kind or time input. They're all just set it and forget it passive investments, which is what makes them so great. Another part of our early retirement plan is real estate. By living frugally in our 20s, we actually saved up enough money at five figure jobs to buy two condos in cash, no mortgage. One of those condos is our old home in Gainesville, Florida, which is now a full-time rental property. It's currently on its third one-year lease with the same tenant, and it's brought in a steady income with very little work from us during that time. We didn't even have to think about it while we were overseas this year. The other condo is our residence at the beach, also in Florida. Before leaving on this vacation, we cleared out all our stuff and stored it between a spare closet, the attic, and an empty room at my mom's house. Thanks, mom. This allowed us to rent out our home while we were gone. Rather than renting it short term like an Airbnb though, which might have required a lot of supervision, we advertised it as a two to three month lease on Facebook Marketplace, which has no fees. Some snowbirds from Canada moved in for two months and luckily they took really good care of our place. So this ended up being easy money too. On top of that, both of our condos experienced appreciation in value while we were gone too, which we track loosely by looking at Zillow and discounting its estimate a little bit to be conservative with our numbers. One of our neighbors actually sold his unit at an all-time high price while we were gone, which was really great to see. Altogether, these investment gains totaled about $28,000 over the course of the three months we were gone, after accounting for all the investment expenses. To be clear though, we absolutely are not counting on $28,000 of investment gains every three months for the rest of our lives. Some components of this number, especially the appreciation in the value of stocks and real estate, could easily be negative over another random three month period. But it's reasonable to assume that all of these things will continue to be positive overall in the long run. And that's the beauty of investing. A lot of people might watch this video and think, well, that's great for you, but I don't have a cushy freelance gig or a big stock portfolio or a paid off rental property. Well, here's the thing, neither did we when we started. We built all of this with average middle class five figure jobs by living frugally and consistently investing the majority of our paychecks. And you don't have to build all the income streams we did before you start taking extended vacations like this one. Just look at the numbers. We could have paid for the expenses of this trip, $17,655, with either our freelance income, which was around $19,000, or our investment gains, which was about $28,000. We didn't need both. In fact, when we took our first long-term vacation in 2015, our full-time salaries were only about $40,000 a year per person, we didn't own a home, and our investment portfolio was tiny compared to where it is today. And we still took a six-month sabbatical and made it work. I'm not gonna lie to you though, the more money you save, the easier all of this does become. So follow Trip of a Lifestyle and get started today. If you like this kind of stuff, don't forget to subscribe or follow along on your favorite social media platform.